It's a new dawn with the ruling of Progressive Congress, who now parades a brand new National Executive Committee. Yesterday, President Muhammad Buhari reiterated the unity of purpose displayed by the leadership of the APC at his national convention on Saturday was indicative of the party's promising success in the 2023 general election. Buhari congratulated the newly elected APC national chairman, Senator Abdullahi Hadamu, and the 79-member National Executive Committee NEC elected at the convention. But he blamed the media for reporting imaginary division within the ranks of the ruling party. Adamu, who emerged through a consensus arrangement, also took a swipe at the People's Democratic Party in his acceptance speech, saying the opposition party is sad and disappointed at the success of the ruling party's national convention. He spoke yesterday after the new National Working Committee, NWC of the APC, was sworn in. A lot to look at this morning, Tunda. Yes, I'm a little baffled about this reference to imaginary divisions. Those divisions <laughs> were very real, so I, I, that's very bizarre. But apart from that, congratulations to the APC, NWC, and the, all the members of the party. They did manage to have their convention in spite of a lot of, you know, naysayers and mm. prophecies of doom. They made it happen, although it wasn't as smooth as I'm sure they would have hoped. There were a little, you know, the tension every so often and some cogs in the wheel. We had this extraordinary scene of somebody in tears. He was that upset that he cried. He was mm. to be driven to tears like that. My heart went out to that gentleman that mm. was um, vying for a youth leader, a dada, Olushegun, mm. I believe his name is. And then you also had that scene as well with Chief Olushegun Oshoba having to apologize to the former minister, um, Bayoshitu, because he mm. was not really, you know, kept informed. He wasn't carried along. He was owed an apology and he received the most public of apologies. That's, that was also a little fly in the ointment there. And obviously the women's leader drama as well, when the consensus did not quite happen and one lady blatantly refused to step down for the other. And so there were, but it's for me remarkable that those are the main issues that can be pointed at. It was expected to be a complete disaster and it was not. So that's good for the APC. Now, beyond the convention, the task still remains to really heal those wounds, because it could be a superficial, let's all keep it together for the convention, and then while the wounds fester. So those wounds do need to be healed. We see what you know, the next stage will be. But they did a lot better than I expected. Mm. Okay, the expectation was that the um, All Progressives Congress would not be able to manage its affairs. The All Progressives Congress, with the leadership provided by President Muhammad Buhari, has proved all the cynics wrong, all the bookmakers wrong. And that was why in the statement by uh, Senator Abdullahi Adamu, uh, you know, he made it clear that, well, he thinks that uh, the people in the other party, the rival main party, the PDP, will be bewildered, they will be sad, they will be unhappy. Uh, that the APC has been able to pull it off, uh, pull it off. Uh, and then, of course, the president, in the statement that was issued on his behalf by uh, Garu Bashir, also pointed out that, well, the people in APC, in PDP, doesn't expect them to be happy. But that in any case, you know, this is all about sour grip. That's the best way, you know, to summarize it. So the president, I think it's uh, some kind of victory for him. He's been able to have his way as national leader of the party. He's been able to say, look, we want uh, consensus as the approach. We want a unity list. And the unity list was agreed upon by the governors. And it's a unity list that prevailed with regard to about 21 of the positions. That's the National uh, Working Committee of the, uh, of the party. Uh, but there were persons, yes, conscientious objectors who said no. We don't want uh, this uh, consensus arrangement. But all the people who oppose the idea of consensus, uh, they lost at the end of the day. The will of uh, the president prevailed. The will of the party uh, prevailed because all the governors just queued up uh, behind the governor. The drama of Beta Edu, you know, that was long in coming. You recall that there was a petition that was written against her, that this was a member of the PDP who followed uh, uh, Ben Ayade, governor of Cross River State, into the APC uh, in 2021. And uh, she was also very critical. We were told 
during the NSAS protests, and that she abused the people of Lagos, she abused the Buhari administration. But uh, today, she's a woman leader. But it wasn't that easy. Ellen Ephium, Ellen Ephium refused to step down for her. But then she still won by uh, a very large uh, margin. And then there were also some uh, salutary uh, indications there. One, the uh, gentleman from Lagos, Dayo Israel, I suddenly adopted the Muslim name. I don't know. I never had him having a Muslim name. But I've always known him as a Dayo Israel. But I know him as a very dynamic person, as a very resourceful uh, young man. And he's the one who has emerged as national youth leader uh, from Lagos. You know, he's uh, you know, one of those good choices that they have made. Now, the PDP, back to the PDP. Nobody should expect the PDP. Uh, the new, uh, uh, you know, uh, the new uh, National Publicity Secretary of the uh, PDP, of course, condemned the process. He said it was an illegal process. He said it was a, a corrupt process. He said uh, even the chairman is uh, illegitimate. You know, well, I don't know. You know, but the APC will not be bothered about that. Let the uh, PDP go and do their own convention and put their own uh, house uh, in order. The job for Abdullah Adamu, senator representing Nasarawa West, is cut out for him. And in his uh, acceptance speech, he said he's going to heal the wounds. He's going to promote uh, uh, reconciliation. Uh, he's going to uh, ensure unity beyond the unity list, which is what we expect him to say. And he has some experience in that regard. He was chairman of the uh, reconciliation uh, committee of the APC ahead of this uh, national convention. Another thing, of course, is that uh, the Senate is now saying he will have to step down as the senator representing Nasarawa West, and INEC will have to organize uh, a by-election. Well, I think that's a no-brainer now that he has a, a bigger job. So the uh, APC uh, can engage, and they've been engaging in triumphalism, in self-congratulation, backslapping from the governor of uh, Oshun State, congratulating Omishore, to the governor of uh, Ekiti State, congratulating the new uh, National Working uh, uh, Committee. I think they are all happy uh, that they've been able to pull this off. But the undercurrents, if you look at the composition, and uh, I think there was a reference to that in the president's statement, all the principal officers, most of them, majority of them, out of the 21, they were persons that came from PDP. They are all PDP people. Mm -hmm. So where is ideology in Nigerian politics? All the people that left the PDP, they are now the ones at the commanding heights of the uh, mm. APC. How about that? Mm -hmm. You know, for the mm -hmm. orientation of political parties uh, in Nigeria. Although in the president's statement, uh, the president was saying, it doesn't matter. These are sinners who have now seen uh, the light. Mm -hmm. Well, tomorrow, these same people will leave APC and they will go to, uh, uh, you know, go back to PDP or go back to uh, another political party. So we, you have this, uh, you know, hall of mirrors, mm -hmm. you know, politicians perpetually shifting, yeah. you know, in uh, Nigerian uh, politics. Mm -hmm. But as for the fact that, uh, you know, uh, the convention did not end up uh, in a war situation, I think that the party deserves uh, to be commended. But the subtext, what follows after? Is the APC now dominant? Uh, is the uh, CPC now dominant in the APC? And what does it say about the ambition of persons like Ashwa Dubola and Metinubo? So there are many areas to look at this. A war happened in that convention. A paper posited it, I think it was the Daily Express, by saying it was gunpoint consensus. A faction won, because a faction brought in the chairman. The unity list was written by a faction. There were way too much undercurrents in the APC. In fact, the division has deepened even further. As we speak today in the APC, there are 10 states with troubles. They can't seem to agree. There was a message put out that there were some states that had to use a statutory delegates because they couldn't come up with a good delegate list. For whatever that happened on the convention ground, congratulations to them. But historically, after the, third, after the Second World War, there was a Cold War. So APC has entered into the face of a Cold War as we speak. The PDP proud to the convention, filed a lawsuit. It will be heard very soon, in the coming days. Let's see how that pans out. Furthermore, 
there are people that are beginning to say that if it doesn't favor them in the presidential primaries, that they're going to take a walk from the party. The party too is fighting hard to bring people in and cover its ranks and say, oh, we must do this in peace and solidarity. But when you look across board, coming to your topic about uh, ideology, if you even look at the PDP, the chairman of the PDP too, at some point, was in the APC. So both parts have cross carpeted and it just shows you how politicians behave. The PDP too is not any better. Only yesterday, Governor Wiki had a big, you know, said he was going to throw his hat in the presidential race. And we all know what that will do for Atiku Abubakar. We know it's going to be a fight at finish. The PDP too is as disoriented as the APC. The question in all of this is what is there for the common man? But in the coming days, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy more drama that will come out of both political parties that have big divisions as we speak. So if anybody thinks the consensus thing covered the ranks of the APC and closed the gap as regards division, I think in the coming days we'll get to see what uh, truly PDP happened. The going to court to challenge APC convention. Mm. That case is dead on arrival. Yeah, at least let the court say it's it. Ufumba case uh, and uh, PDP versus Silva. Uh, no, that case is yes, dead on arrival. You arrive. know, the, no locals and everything, but let the court say it. So we'll see that in the coming days. And they've been abusing each other. I mean, when the... The, the chairman of the APC said something about the PDP. The PDP replied that, don't forget, you have a 15 billion EFCC case. They've been going at each other. But both of them, the APC and PDP, they both have divisions. That's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break. When we return, we'll have Ruth Zuderi, Michael Wilson, Adesu Amora, Aaron Akiri, to give us updates on Africa, global business, COVID-19, and sporting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. For a global business update, Michael Wilson joins us now from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, mixed Asia trade, looking for direction, really. No big headlines out of the war at the moment, although um, the Biden misstep is getting a lot of publicity. But that said, that's not really uh, an investment decision. Oil prices have declined slightly. Profits at Chinese industrial firms up 5%. But basically, everybody's thinking about the Shanghai uh, rolling lockdown, which uh, has actually taken the heat out of the oil market because of consumption worries and so on. I'll come on to what, the, what that's actually meant. Um, investors have been really watching to find out what China's what Chinese authorities are going to do uh, to try to stimulate the economy after this worst COVID outbreak since the height of the last pandemic in 2020. Um, and so, so basically there's a lockdown from today until April the 1st, and then there's a lockdown from April the 1st and through till April the 5th um, in Shanghai. So we'll continue to uh, measure that Tesla has halted production at one of its factories is there and mainland Chinese equity markets have fallen a little bit today. Some shares though, some China shares in listed in Hong Kong, Mechuen uh, and Tencent have climbed um, as a result of better than expected results. The Hang Seng slip generally speaking. Um, we're talking about sanctions on oil exports from Russia. Apparently, India is snapping up cheap Russian oil, and China may well be next. Since the beginning of the March, since the beginning of March, five cargoes of Russian oil—that's about six million barrels—have been loaded and are bound for India. If China buys cheap Russian oil, remember China is one of the biggest importers of oil, and it's widely expected to be discounted. That will um, that will happen, uh, according to the IEA, at least. That will happen, and they'll drive up the oil price. Um, elsewhere. Um, as far as the United States is concerned, futures not doing a great deal this morning over the weekend, but last week uh, the Dow and S&P rose in the previous session to close out their second consecutive winning streak. So shares actually in the United States doing quite well. Dow gained 153 points, S&P advanced 0.5%. Um, 
And all this is, of course, uh, predicated by investors actually wondering what's going to happen as far as uh, Ukraine and Russia is concerned. And will, will the peace talks that are apparently planned this week for Turkey bring forth any uh, any fruit? And Amazon is facing another um, high stakes union election. This is on Staten Island. Um, it's the warehouse known as the JFK. Uh, and it's been at the centre of uh, Amazon dissent for some time. Employees at, uh, at the uh, um, employees are voting to see whether um, they 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 will be uh, causing or creating um, a, a trade union for them. People are reminded that, of course, if you have a trade union, you've got to pay trade union dues, and that sometimes wipes out the increases in wages. But again, this is the decision. Um, which needs to be made. Um, the UK, uh, the Chancellor, Rishi Sunak, the Finance Minister, is apparently going to is considering some kind of regulation on cryptocurrencies. These are stable coins, actually, not so much the bitcoins that you're seeing there, but stable coins which are uh, linked to uh, fiat, normal, normal currencies. Um, the Treasury says it's been in discussion with a number of organisations, including the crypto exchange Gemini, uh, which, uh, which and details will come uh, later in the month. But again, it's it's looking at regulation of these currencies and not not necessarily endorsing them per se. Um, the UK Transport Secretary Grant, Grant Shapps is going to say to P&O, if you want to use our docks in this country, then you need to pay minimum wage. Difference being minimum wage is round about 9.50 uh, and the, the crews, apparently these new ones, to replace the 800 whom, who were sacked by P&O are on £5.50 an hour. So um that's that's quite a, that's quite a big thing and what he's saying to P&O is reinstate those workers or else um uk sizewell c nuclear power station this is the one next to the sizewell b it's not built yet the government apparently is going to take 20 percent stake edf in france is going to take 20 percent and this is therefore to encourage uh maybe other investors to uh move into nuclear as uh, as all these options for energy prices are considered by the government and as i was saying right at the beginning of this report oil prices are sliding after that road those rolling lockdowns uh, in Shanghai. Um, I, I went through the figures for you earlier on. I won't repeat them, but uh, the, most people are saying this is probably quite temporary um, as, as it stands at the moment. And as far as the week ahead is concerned, lots of big economic numbers, uh, but the big one, of course, the jobs numbers, which you'll get from the United States on Friday. That is your Global View. Good morning. Michael, real quickly, uh, number one, I'd like to talk about the cost of living crisis in the UK. I can't talk about it enough and still fall out from that uh, statement by Rishi Sunak. Uh, people are uh, beginning to analyze things and, and analysts in the UK are saying this current plan and by not helping the people that 1.3 million people will be plunged into poverty in Britain. 1.3 million people. That's a staggering number. And at the same time, household incomes will drop. So is it fair for the government to wait till elections before they bring out the goodie bag while people are plunging poverty? And secondly, Joe Biden now wants to put a tax on the rich, the billionaire tax, he calls it. He wants to take a certain 20% percentile on over 100 million income. How's that going to work? Uh, okay. Uh, cost of living in this country uh, over the over the weekend uh, the newspapers have been full of uh, stories about Rishi Sunak and the kind of opposition this has been getting from cabinet ministers not doing enough I reported to you on Friday that the Prime Minister said the government needs to do more um, is it fair to wait until elections? What's fair about politics and what's fair about elections? No, of course it isn't. It should be supporting people all the time. But poverty, that's an interesting word to apply to the UK economy. There's poverty, there's Africa poverty, there's poverty in China, there's poverty in North Korea, uh, poverty in countries around the world. And yet the UK poverty, not quite the same kind of thing. I think you have to get certainly, I'm not decrying it at all. People will be in difficulties. But when you talk about poverty, it's a very, 
very emotional word and it doesn't really apply um, in, 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 in the UK. However, having so said, it's a big political problem and, and nothing is going to solve this right now. It may be that the government will, will come in and start to increase benefits again to people. But remember, as I also said on Friday, there's very few votes in, in, in for the Tories, for the Conservatives, in actually giving people who reply completely, uh, rely completely on benefits, getting an increase in the benefits. That doesn't get them votes for the Tory party. It's only the working poor that, who, who actually are seen to benefit from any kind of, uh, th and this is very cold political calculation, but that's what politicians actually do. As far as Biden's concerned, yes, I'd be very interested to see that. Remember that their billion is a thousand million. Uh, in this country, it's a million million. So a billionaire's tax um, is missing a zero all the way along the line. How it will be collected, I don't know. I always maintain that people in that kind of class actually move their money around fairly quickly. So it'll be very, very slippery to do this. Again, it sounds good. And it's going gonna, it's gonna to help the coffers. I didn't actually put down the figures here. $360 billion worth of increase to the coppers, in the, ne of the, the, the nation's coffers in the next decade. And he's planning to start this in the, the budget in 2023. Good luck with that. Um, um, Michael, I get your point about poverty being relative. That's quite a patriotic point when you say African poverty is different from poverty in Britain. So I get a subtext, but very quickly. Shanghai, how strategic is Shanghai? That Shanghai being locked down from today across the, uh, the uh, river to the east uh, resulted in disruptions in terms of uh, the spot price of uh, fuel. 26, 25 million population in Shanghai. Before now, we had the lockdown in Jilin, we had in Shenzhen. Uh, is this about the zero COVID uh, strategy? And Western media are trying to prove uh, that it's not quite working or it's, there's something, some truth to the strategic nature of Shanghai. And then second, energy. Now, Canada, after that uh, International Energy Agency meeting that you talked about, the International Agency, uh, uh, you know, uh, Energy Agency is saying that very soon there will be about three million barrels of uh, uh, oil of the market, and that, that's going to cause a lot of disruption. But now the European uh, Union countries are rushing to the U.S. Uh, to ask for supply. Can the, does the U.S. have the capacity? Canada is saying it will increase its production by about 200,000 barrels uh, per day, and later to about 300,000 barrels, and also increase its supply of uh, uranium. Well, all of these options, even African countries, including Nigeria, Nigeria and Angola, they're saying, and Algeria, they're saying, oh, they will supply gas uh, to Europe. Do they have the infrastructure? Is there really an alternative uh, to what is provided within the energy market by Russia? Okay. It is amazing what happens in times of international crisis, isn't it? People start to find different answers to questions which they didn't bother asking before in times of plenty. When it actually comes down to it, you suddenly find that there are a lot of, a lot of wrinkles everywhere, a lot of increases in supply that could possibly come from countries like Nigeria and Angola and indeed Canada. It's possible. And indeed the UK. It's, it's all possible. It really depends on price. Now, if you try, and believe me, I've tried to do this over the past week, to talk to energy analysts and say, do you know how much oil there is? The answer to that question is no, they do not. You see, I'm, I'm saying this morning that what's been happening with India, India has been taking possession of cheap Russian oil, according to the news sources. China may follow. So why, why is this on the market? Why are not sanctions actually taking place to stop all this? So whilst all these different kind of these, these, these different conditions are swirling around it's very very difficult to get a definitive idea about what's really happening all i would say is that necessity is the mother of invention that's the thing and that's what we're finding right now as far as shanghai is concerned i mean all i can do is point to the oil markets as well for a couple of days they've decided that that will be enough to reduce the demand on oil and therefore the price has slipped will it last 
who knows? I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to that question. All I can see is this, this, this zero COVID policy is something which the Chinese must have costed, that the central covers must be aware of this and aware what it is actually costing. Remember, it's from now until April the 1st and then from April the 1st to second stage till April the 5th. It's not a huge amount of time, but it is it apparently, according to the markets, is causing a dent in the demand for oil. Well, we don't have a huge amount of time, but I must say, just yesterday I was reading about a 14-year-old boy who fainted at a food bank in London. So try telling him the difference between poverty in the UK and poverty in Africa. Rufai. Thank you so much, Tundu. Uh, for update on COVID-19 pandemic, Adesua Mora is here with us. Adesua, great to have you. Great to be here, Rufai. Good morning. Good morning, Dr. Bati, and good morning, Tundum. Well, let's take a look at the latest development around the world when it comes to the coronavirus pandemic. We're still very much in it. And the global coronavirus caseload has topped 480 million, while the deaths have surged to more than 6.12 uh, million. According to the Johns Hopkins University tally, we've also had 10.86 billion vaccine doses administered globally. A reminder that vaccine inequity still persists very much with us. And the U.S. continues to be the worst hit country with the world's highest number of cases and deaths. Well, here in Nigeria, 52 new infections from six states as well as the federal capital territory now puts the country's total infection at 255,296. No COVID-19 related deaths have been recorded in Nigeria for a long time now. However, the country's death toll remains at 3,000 one hundred and forty two. Yes, China's biggest city will lock down its eastern half from Monday. Actually, it's gone into effect until Friday, followed by a similar lockdown of its western side beginning on April 1st. The phased lockdown is to curb an Omicron fueled COVID-19 outbreak uh, that has hit China. On Sunday alone, the country recorded 4,500 domestically transmitted cases, and that's according to official figures coming out of China. Shanghai has become a leading sport in recent times. This lockdown, which has gone into effect again, is China's largest since the coronavirus outbreak began more than two years ago. Well, to Germany, where the health minister has said the country is a long way from declaring a freedom day from COVID-19 as cases continue to mount. Well, Germany's Public Health Institute uh, on Friday announced an additional 296,498 new cases and 288 deaths. Uh, only last week, lawmakers in Germany voted uh, to relax most federal rules on wearing masks and testing for the virus. But the health minister in the country has urged the country's 16 states to ensure social distancing and other safety measures. Uh, in virus hotspots remain. And finally, to the U.S., where the Academy Awards returned to the Dolby Theatre in Hollywood with three hosts for the first time in four years. Amy Schumer, Regina Hall, and Wanda Sykes uh, co-hosted the festivities, which had very strict COVID-19 protocols in place. Guests were required to show proof of vaccination, as well as undergo several rounds of testing. And I can assure you they were so strict because our Kachi Ofia and Inkechi Nana, who are on ground in Los Angeles uh, to cover the Oscars for us, have had to do at least three PCR COVID-19 tests, and of course show proof of uh, full vaccination to even be on the red carpet. Uh, there were few people who were told to, to wear masks in different parts of the halls, and I'm sure uh, Kachi or Nkechi will be filling you with more updates from the Oscar uh, sometime during the course of the show this morning. Back to you guys. Let's start with uh, Germany. Last Friday, the uh, German parliament uh, voted to relax uh, COVID uh, mandates, uh, social distancing, you know, wearing of masks and all of that. But at the same time, it was discovered uh, that the uh, Omicron uh, 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 variant, you know, is uh, spreading widely, which is the thing that has been observed in other parts of the world. And it's on the basis of that that the uh, German uh, health minister, Karl Lauterberg, has now said that, look, 
uh, the 16 states that make up uh, the German Federation we just have to take their own decisions because within 24 hours, between Friday and Saturday, there were over 296,000 cases of uh, infection. Uh, despite the fact that uh, there is up to about 76% vaccination rate uh, in uh, uh, Germany. And what, that's why I now said, look, it's not Freedom Day yet. And that's precisely the same position that has been taken by the WHO to say that countries still have to take precautions because it looks like, you know, COVID is going to be with us for a long time and that, in fact, we may have uh, to live with it. Now, the Chinese, they are much criticized, uh, you know, uh, COVID zero policy. Uh, they've remained uh, committed to it. It was adopted in Hong Kong and in mainland China. We have seen it being adopted in Jilin, in Shenzhen, and now Shanghai has been shut down this morning, Monday. From now to Friday, on the eastern side of the river, that device uh, the town, and then thereafter till April 5, you know, on the uh, western side of the uh, river. But the thing, of course, is that the people seem themselves to be tired. Too many testings, they say, uh, but uh, the government says, well, it's zero COVID policy. Uh, Shanghai is uh, a technology and manufacturing hub. But the danger of this uh, on the economy is that many companies are pulling out you know, of uh, Shanghai, they are leaving, they are taking their businesses out because they think that, you know, the uh, zero COVID policy, uh, you know, puts too much pressure on, uh, on uh, business. And then, of course, I was bringing, I brought this up earlier on with Michael, how the market, the oil market also responded, dropped, you know, uh, by about 2.5% on account of the lockdown uh, in uh, Shanghai. Well, finally, uh, the other point I wanted to bring up bring to your attention. It's a, a piece, uh, you know, written by one uh, doctor who says long COVID now affects people's brains. That even if you have uh, my symptoms, it's a problem. That uh, your gray matter will be reduced. You know, you will lose attention. Uh, you will suffer depression. You may even have a stroke. And this is uh, the uh, product of uh, uh, a research done at the University of Oxford, and which has been uh, peer reviewed. So it looks like uh, whether we remove the mask or we stop social distancing, once you have a COVID, whether it's mild or severe, you may be in trouble for life. Oh dear. And mm. speaking of a doctor, so there was a South Korean doctor who posted on Facebook and I guess had the good sense to delete that post that if you haven't had COVID, that means you don't have any friends. What do you <laughs> think of that? <laughs> <laughs> this one? And also, um, just to add that um, Naftali Bennett, um, of Israel, Israel's prime minister has tested positive for COVID. But what do you make of that? That you have no, you're Michael, no mates. <laughs> you haven't mm -hmm. had COVID. <laughs> well, that post was deleted after much criticism in, um, I think it was a Hong Kong doctor, South Korea doctor, I can't remember. But as for Naftali Bennett, again, it shows that the vaccines we have at the moment do not really prevent uh, this infection they only help us to prevent severe diseases and curb deaths and there's no vaccine that is 100 percent uh protection no vaccine not even uh the polio vaccines that we've had uh the measles uh so it's not just covid 19 vaccines there is no vaccine in the world that is 100 percent protective and the who remember at the at the beginning of all of this had said the benchmark for vaccines for COVID-19 was going to be 50%. But at the moment we have vaccines that, that you know, go to stop uh, diseases and spread of infections up to 90%. Some of them as, uh, as high as 90%. So you would see breakthrough infections, including those who have gotten their, uh, their jabs and even booster jabs. But what you see is that the, it's very mild. They're able to go about their lives, uh, much like every other person because they've been vaccinated. You made that this was a very perfect point. The fact that it gives you a fighting chance, because what the vaccine does is it alerts your system about the prevalence of a virus or a disease like that. So your system knows how to fight it even better. So it's sort of like a, an, an alarm mechanism for, like a fire alarm mechanism, you know, that when the, 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 the virus comes into your system, 
it triggers an alarm and tells other parts of your body and your t-cells and the likes fight it fight it fight it it's an invader and it gives you a better fighting just and it's way better than you not getting vaccinated so it is best for you go out there exactly. get jabbed get vaccinated vaccines are really important they give a lot of people a fighting chance well wow, thank you this one now our dependable rosa sadiri is here to give us an african business update Good morning, Rotis. Good morning, Tundu. Good morning, Rufai. Good morning, uh, Doctor. Yeah, we're starting to see the impact of lower FACA locations, Federal Accounts Allocation Committee, uh, uh, payments into the Federation account from the NNPC as a result of higher um, fuel prices, resulting in them having to make lower um, to having to make lower payments to the Federation account as a result of subsidies affecting some states. The Daily Trust um, has uh, an investigation that they carried out, Daily Trust newspaper, where some states are actually seeing civil servants being paid lower salaries or salaries are being rationed. Uh, they mentioned Kano states um, cutting uh, salaries. They mentioned, I believe, Kogi state rationing. And even where there are some civil servants who are getting paid at the state level, at the local government level, they are also being um, affected. Spokesperson uh, for, in, for the Kano state government said that it's a result of the reduction in FAC allocations. I believe they got $6.9 in December 2021. That got reduced about 5.4 in January. And there's going to be another reduction in that in, in February. Funny enough, is it ironically that the NLC uh, Labor Congress um, um, subsidiaries in each of these states are crying foul and saying that they should be paid? Meanwhile, we're still paying 30,000 naira minimum wage. It's, it's, it's staggering. And they still can't make the payments even at that 30,000. So um, the spokesperson in Kano State, for instance, said, well, if the federation uh, allocation increases, then we will hopefully be able to restore these payments. Many of these states depend on federal allocations to augment their, uh, their, their revenues as far as their internally generated revenue is concerned, or their total revenue package, excuse me, because they're not generating enough. There's even a wider conversation about going to externally generated revenue, and just, you know, because the internal portion is just not doing uh, well enough. So that's what's going on with a number of the states uh, that I've mentioned. Even Undo states, I believe, was mentioned uh, as well in that investigation. So. I, and I say ironically that the NLC is making this case because it is the same NLC that wants fuel subsidies to continue. And you are seeing what the, the, the impact of that is on, uh, on allocations as, as salaries are concerned. We move to the governors. The governors um, are, in Nigerian governors are in Dubai uh, for an investment forum. They are going to go and seek investments for different sectors in their various um, uh, states. Um, Kaede Fayambi, a state governor, chair of the Nigerian Governors Forum, he's the one that put this um, uh, together. So a number of them are going to be in either today, tomorrow, looking for different investments in agriculture, in ICT, and so on and so forth. The question is, if you are an investor looking at the news coming out of Nigeria, let's say a governor wants to get an investment to go into aviation. And we see the news that broke, uh, was it Friday or Saturday, about the attack on Kaduna State that apparently delayed an Asman air flight. How do you explain that? This is, again, the talk about how in, um, insecurity in Nigeria deters, is a, is a deterrence to investment that can hamper things. So if we take a look, I think we have the Asman uh, statement. There's been some back and forth. Asman basically said that, well, there was uh, an incident in a village near the Kaduna, uh, Kaduna airport, and that's what caused them to delay their flights. Um, they, la they, are, they landed in Kaduna at 12.36 p.m. They boarded by, I think, 1.04 p.m. Then the control tower, the, the fourth paragraph or so, says that they offered a safety advice to hold on to departure due to security threats in a village close to the airport, and this delayed their departure. There's been a lot of talk about where these airports are situated and how they overlap into um, surrounding villages. Maybe you have to you know, do what's been done with the um, expressways, where you have to pay for in the individuals around the areas to, to, to remove the space that's there so that you can accommodate the these, um, uh, these uh, infrastructure. But it's an issue. And overall, we know somebody from uh, the aviation management, NAMA, died and you, we, we see what's been happening there. But a flight was delayed. And so we're on top of all the other challenges that the aviation sector is facing um, from high fuel costs, uh, high maintenance costs, uh, lower margins. You've got the insecurity thing that continues to um, to rear its ugly head. Mm -hmm. um, beyond that, multi-choice is raising um, their prices uh, as of April the 1st. Um, they cited business conditions and Inflation. Those are yeah. the two things that they that they mentioned. 
Inflation, we understand. The business conditions has to be um, the competition that they're facing from streaming services. Streaming services have been eating into uh, their revenues for quite a while. If you think about a typical, typical person that moves into a new place, they decide, well, we'll just get broadband internet and use Arise Play or Netflix or one of the other streaming options as opposed to, to um, using multi-choice. And then also, this kind of ties into the Oscar thing. I know you guys will get into that later on. But if, um, streaming is also impacting viewership for live television. So, if, for example, um, I was just looking at year 20, 12 to the past 20 years, Oscar viewership is down like 79% as a result of what we're seeing from streaming and people just, I guess, being less interested. But that, they can fix the problem. Oh, multi-choice? Yes, there's a solution to it. And it's a solution that is evident everywhere in the world. They should take those streaming services and put them on their boxes too. Just like so, Sky does it. Yeah, you put your Netflix on the box and everything. Have a premium package where people pay so that when you pay for a DS solution, you can watch Netflix at the same time and you can watch one or two other streaming services. Yeah, but would Netflix agree to that? They agree. They do it in England. It's on the Sky box. You can watch your Netflix on your Sky box in England. Yeah, so, but you'd have to pay for that now. You have you to pay, pay for, for the privilege of so that you content. So you aggregate the cost just for you to go in and yeah, have but a cost. going to go up. But, I mean, so at least, would you rather lose the revenue? So Hulu, Netflix, yeah, so you pick Peacock, the one, so you pay all of them and put no, them on your no, box? No, so you pick the one you want to pay. I mean, you don't watch all the streaming services. Right, right, So right. you just pick the one you want that is more prominent that okay. you put. Maybe they can put a rise play on Netflix. That's the solution to that problem. Okay. Moving on. So we have a big problem. Where? Even, pick where? Where's the no, problem? No, the big problem is as regards the state of the economy okay, insecurity. and the fact mm. that okay, it's going down. Right, right. And I'm not surprised it's going down. And that's why we need to build refineries. We need to solve our problem because our problems is, our problems, I will say problems, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> problems is, our problems go back right. to not solving the problems of the past. Right. We've not built refineries. Because of that, we're, there, there's still a lot of crude oil. And I, I, because we can't refine if we don't build refineries. Oil theft. Oil theft is on the increase and myriads of other problems. Mm. And at the, at the same time, we're not producing enough to be able to defend our currency. So I was doing just a quick analysis. You talked about FAC. You talked about minimum wage. You can't pay 30,000 naira. Rotus, the NLC had an argument with President Sheo Shagari in the 80s in this country. They finally decided on 125 naira minimum wage in the 1980s. Rotus, that 125 naira in the early 1980s was $125. That's right, I knew you were going to. $125 today is 73,900. Which is almost that's 80, two, twice, twice the amount of the minimum wage. So, if the minimum wage in 1980, benchmark rate for rates, okay, probably not adjusted for inflation, is 74,000 naira. And in 2022, the minimum wage is 30,000 naira, and they can't pay. You see that a lot has gone up wrong with the economy. Right. So it's a big holistic economic fix we need. Right. I really wish all those governors all the very best in this trip to Dubai. But right. how is it not going to just be another junket? I mean, you saw that memo that made the rounds about the Plateau State mm -hmm. um, trip costing, was it 74 million naira? And you've really nice juxtaposition there. Right. Dwindling fact um, allocations, the fact that people are going without their full salary or a salary at all for months, mm -hmm. and then you now have people wandering off to Dubai. And I it mean, could have been a virtual summit. Yes, Remember, junkers. Ghana, yeah, Ghana, Ghana cuts. Ghana, we, we talked about Ghana last week and how they are making cuts to augment their fiscal structure, which is deteriorating. Ghana has cuts foreign trips for a number of, you know, uh, appointments. Yeah, so, and they should. It's ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And well, you are correct. Two major numbers. reports from the NMPC in the last few days. The first is the presentation by NMPC before the Federation. Uh, accounts allocation committee where NMPC made it clear that look because of what is called under recovery mm. NMPC has spent over 400 billion naira on a, on a subsidy in January and February alone and for the allocation for April is going to deduct 328 billion or rather for March to be able to cover costs of under recovery. Yeah. Okay? Now, what does this tell us? It says, it shows us that the subsidy regime is unsustainable. But the Nigerian government has postponed the evil day by another 18 months. Now, with the fluctuations in uh, the uh, forex exchange rate, foreign exchange rate, and also with uh, the, uh, uh, the spot price of crude oil behaving like a yo-yo mm. going up and down. Being very 
uh, extremely volatile, would the Nigerian government be able to address that uh, challenge? So this is what happens when you are not productive at home, when the productive base of the country is not working. Now the states are complaining that they will not get revenue. Some states are saying we will not be able to pay salaries. Have they been paying the salaries before now? Yes. They are not paying arrears. Even the uh, uh, police force cannot get money to pay, uh, uh, to pay the new uh, rates approved by the president of Nigeria. Edo 2020, the Ministry of Finance has not been able to work on the papers for more than one year to be able to provide the uh, approved support for Edo State Government. So we're in a crisis because our states are not centers of productivity. They are centers of consumption. So every month, everybody is talking about the Federal uh, Allocation Committee. Everybody is looking towards uh, NMPC and crude oil exports and imports, okay? Accounting for over 70, 80% of our foreign exchange earnings. So we need to talk about the basics. It's not enough to talk about you know, the uh, fallout, the uh, causative, the, the, uh, the, the, the fallouts, the effect of all of these distortions uh, within the Nigerian economy. The second report that uh, NMPC provided in the last few days is what they call the balance of payments report. And they were reporting that over 116 million liters of uh, fuel were lost in 2021 alone resulting in over 18.88 billion naira. Or is it dollars? Dollars. Okay, if you have the injection of that volume of money into the Nigerian economy, and they are saying that all of this, uh, you know, imported crude, this is not even uh, uh, crude oil or produce, you know, onshore or offshore, wherever. This is imported crude. And NMPC is the sole importer of crude in this country. Many of the marketers cannot play in that field because they don't have access to forex, because they have also other challenges. But between Atlas Cove and the Mosme, when the fuel is brought in, it is stolen. Mm. The fuel does not get to its uh, destinations. So all these problems have been defined, and the person that suffers on account of it is the ordinary man. Okay, you don't have the access to the fuel. Money that should be used for development is used, uh, you know, uh, to. Uh, augment states mm. that are unproductive, and many of them are unviable. To what it matters, the CBN reported in the last few days that on uh, education, study abroad, and medical tourism, that Nigeria in 2021 alone spent over $39.66 billion. Where is that coming from? So we just repatriate funds, you know, to other countries because our schools are not good enough, because our hospitals are not good enough. Finally, as for more teachers. I think you meant Naira. Or Is it Naira? Yeah, or, yeah, or million dollars. No, it's dollars. Oh, 39.66 billion dollars. CBN yeah, it's billion. It's billion. It's dollars. It's dollars. 39.66 yes. billion, billion dollars. For people to send their children because abroad. I, I think and, I, the, and for, for, for people to go the, for medical in one care. Year. Yeah. 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 Okay, I have to. Have, I remember that chart I brought up here. That was over a span of. Have a tuition fee, seventeen thousand pounds. Yeah, but that's four times our budget. No problem. Yes, yeah, yes, yes. Go ahead. Choice. Yes. Okay, I know it's a luxury item. Yes. If they overprice their material, some of us will stop watching uh, uh, multi choice. I, think, I <laughs> yes. can watch Arise TV. Okay. Yes. But I think what is important about it is that um, the uh, Consumer Protection Commission. The FCCPC, as it's otherwise called, yeah. has waited in to give a number of uh, conditions to say, look, you can't change your rates within the space of one year, you know, and that you have to give certain options uh, to the consumer of those services. It may sound elitist, but for people who like to watch television, who like to go on DSTV, who like to go on the uh, Go TV, I don't think any company at all, whether you know, it's uh, streaming services or whatever, should be allowed an unusual monopoly, you know, and uh, to fix prices, you know, as they wish. And that's why I think the Com Consumer Protection Agency should continue to focus on this mm -hmm. and see how they can protect, uh, you know, people. But as for me, if it's too expensive, I'll stop watching, stop watching it. it. You use alter alternatives. <laughs> All right. You will use area. <laughs> Antenna. Anyway, thank you, Rose. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. <laughs>